Welcome to the Full Armor of God Bible Study, using Scripture to interpret Scripture, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. We have now come to the portion of the study where we will begin looking at the verse, individual verses with all their cross-references. Each verse will be typed out and then broken down by phrase, as indicated in my study Bible. And underneath the phrase, its cross-references will be listed through the fourth level inter of interpretation with the verses typed out for three of the levels. The fourth will contain only the scripture reference. And by following this pattern, we will be using scripture to interpret scripture. And if you've never studied this way before, I hope you find it enlightening for this method of study will provide better understanding for any verse in scripture. This study method will take you all through the Bible. It is truly amazing how it is all woven together like a beautiful tapestry. And it's only logical that it all fits together perfectly because after all, all of it was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And because it does fit together so perfectly, that serves as even more proof that it is indeed inspired by God. Sometimes, though, when studying this way, you'll come to a point where the progression of references ends. This only means that God has given us all the information we need about that particular subject at this time. Our God Jehovah is so deep and invites each of us to meet Him, walk with Him, and develop a deeper relationship with Him through His Word. And I pray this study facilitates just that. A lot of thought, prayer, and time have been put into this study, so I hope you will please take advantage of all the resources, photos, videos, articles, etc., provided because they are reinforcement to what has been discussed, as well as offering additional strength and encouragement for the battle. Now, may the Lord of hosts, the Lord God Almighty, bless you as we dig into his marvelous word of truth. All glory and honor to him. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Ephesians 6.10a Finally, be strong in the Lord. References 1 Corinthians 16.13, 2 Timothy 2.1, and Ephesians 1.19. Ephesians 6.13a, Be on the alert. Reference Matthew 24.42 In the very first phrase of the first verse of this passage, we are told, Be strong in the Lord. And when we look at the first cross-reference of that phrase, it says, Be on the alert, which sounds like a warning. What would be strong in the Lord have to do with a warning? What are we being warned of? The answer is found in the cross-reference of Matthew 24 and all its cross-references. Matthew 24:42 says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Reference Matthew 24:43 and 44, Matthew 25:10 and 13, Luke 12:39 and 21:36. In all these references, we are being warned to be on the alert because Jesus is coming back and we need to be watching and waiting for his return. We may not know the day or the hour of his return, but that doesn't mean we can't discern his approaches drawing near. But before we go any further, let me ask you a question. Do you think God wants us ignorant concerning things which shall come to pass in the future? No, he doesn't because he's provided us with prophetic scriptures concerning Jesus' return through his written word. And if he wanted us to be ignorant about things of the future, then why would he have the Holy Spirit inspire John to write the book of Revelation? That whole book is filled with end-time events yet future. And since the Old Testament prophecies and signs concerning Christ's birth, death, and resurrection have been fulfilled with 100% accuracy, we can be sure and trust that the prophetic scriptures related to the future return of Christ will also be fulfilled with 100% accuracy. God does not lie, and all of his word is true. And everything will come to pass just because God has said it would. His word does not return to him void. Jesus, too, gave prophetic signs to the disciples when, he asked him, when they asked him what would be the sign of his return. So the Holy Spirit is reminding us in this passage about the future return of Christ, for we've been told not just once, but four times to be on the alert. What additional information can be gained from these cross-references? Jesus can return at any moment. 
and to be alert we need to recognize the God-given signs that the time is drawing near. Another reference here says that he's coming at an hour we do not think he will. And to be ready, we need to stay on the alert, for other cross-references here say he's coming like a thief in the night, and no one knows exactly when a thief is coming, so that's why we need a warning to be on the alert. And the references from Matthew chapter 25 illustrate this same idea, referring to the ten virgins, five foolish and five wise. Why were five of them called wise? They were wise because they were ready and had oil in their lamps. They were prepared, waiting and watching for the coming of the bridegroom. And when he came, they went in with him and the door was closed. And that's a warning because when God closes the door, no man can open it. Do you remember when he closed the door on the ark after Noah and his family entered in? Matthew chapter 25 is very interesting when you compare the customs of a Jewish wedding to our wedding as the bride of Christ. See attached link for additional info concerning this. Our bridegroom Jesus is coming and his bride, the church, should be ready, waiting and watching to go in with him into the wedding feast. Scripture says we won't know the exact day or hour of Christ's return, but in spite of that, we should be ready, waiting and watching for his return. And a special reward will be given to those because God promises a special crown to believers who fix their eyes and hearts heavenward in watchfulness of Christ's return. 2 Timothy 4 8. And another reason we need to be alert and ready is because Scripture tells us, although not referenced in this section, that He will return in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians 15 52. Just think about how quick that's going to be, like a nanosecond. And when he comes, there'll be no more time to get ready. And scripture warns that those who were not will be like the foolish virgins who were shut out. Let those who have ears hear what the Spirit is saying. So in the first section of 1 Corinthians 16, 13, we were told to be strong and be on the alert because we do not know when Jesus is coming back. Now, in 1 Corinthians 16, 13b, it says, Stand firm in the faith. And it references 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Galatians 5, 1, Philippians 1, 27, Philippians 4, 1, 1 Thessalonians 3, 8, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 says, Now I make known to you, brethren, part B, the gospel which I preached to you, part C, which also you believed in which you also stand, and then it lists all the cross-references. So what do we learn from these references that will tell us how to stand firm in the faith? And what do we place our faith? And how will our faith motivate us to stand firm? The answer is found in the complete verse of 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. And the reference of 2 Corinthians 1.24 says, In your faith you are standing firm. So we place our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, its grace and its promises, for it will never fail. It will never falter. God's word is forever steadfast and provides a solid foundation of truth upon which we can build our lives and stand firmly. And in this we should rejoice because we know that the gospel comes from God and God does not lie. We stand firm in the faith when we believe in, trust upon, and rejoice in the hope that the gospel provides. But what do we learn from these cross-references that will motivate us to continue standing firm? Well, one day we will be required to give an account of how we live our lives, both saved and unsaved alike. And God will judge our secrets. And when this is kept in the forefront of our minds, it will motivate us to want to study, follow, and be obedient to the instruction of his word. Another motivation is found in the cross-reference of Romans 11.20. Notice what it says. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. Who is they referred to in this verse? They are the Jewish nation who crucified Jesus Christ. It's God's chosen people who were broken off. From what were they broken off? 
They were broken off of the true and living vine, Jesus Christ. He is the vine and we are the branches. And their unwillingness to accept him broke Jesus' heart. You can almost hear the anguish and heartache in his voice for his own people as we read his words. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. Matthew twenty-three thirty-seven. Can you imagine how Jesus felt in his humanness? It breaks my heart to imagine it. But when the Jews rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ, it was then taken, proclaimed, and offered to the Gentiles. That's us. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. But now wait a minute. Let's not go thinking we're better than the Jews. What does the phrase do not conceited, be conceited mean in that verse? Just because God broke off his chosen people from the branch, we are warned not to become conceited by thinking that the church has somehow replaced Israel. This is a lie from the pits of hell. It's a doctrine of demons called replacement theology, and Satan is running rampant with it these days. Even many of the elect have been deceived by this doctrine, and you need to be aware of it if you aren't already. And this is the reason for this reference being stuck in this particular spot because it follows right after the reference of Romans 5.2 which speaks of rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God because of the introduction by faith into the grace in which we Gentiles can stand. No, we can't be conceited thinking the church is better than the Jews. We are all part of God's family. Here's another thought concerning that. Consider this for just a moment. If God made promises to his chosen people and they were broken off, how secure could we be in his promises to us? We couldn't be. God is the covenant keeper, and that's the whole point of why Romans 11.20 is listed here. Remember the title of this study? Scripture, interpreting scripture. The whole point here when Paul gives the warning fear right after telling us not to be conceited, is because of the reason for the Jews being broken off. Did you catch it? Let's read it again. It wasn't God that broke them off. Scripture says quite right they were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited but fear. It was because of their unbelief in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, that they were broken off. And we're to fear because the warning still applies today. No matter whom we are, if we don't accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the only access to God, we too will be broken off and cast into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I'll close this section with one last question. After reading that verse in Matthew 20. Three, do you really think Jesus would forsake his own people, the Jewish nation? Certainly not, and let's look at a couple of verses that support it. Right after he spoke that lament to Jerusalem in verse 37, he then continues in verse 38 and 39 and said, Behold, your house is being left de to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those verses offer just one proof that Israel will eventually come around and we need to pray for God's chosen people. God even tells us to, Psalm 122. For even though as a whole Israel rejected God's Son as Messiah, God still loves them, just like he does us when we sin. And God disciplines those he loves. So God is not through with a Jew. Go and read all of Romans chapter 11. Many scholars believe that the whole purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. And one day Israel will recognize Jesus as their true Messiah, but it won't happen until the tribulation. God does not change. His word has been established and will surely come to pass. Psalm 119 states that God's word is forever and has been settled in heaven. But for the purpose of this section we're examining, let's look at it from the NIV this time. It says, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. 
Wouldn't you agree that it's perfect for this section on standing firm? Scripture supports that God has not replaced the nation of Israel with the church. So be a Berean and search the scriptures for yourself. I've referred to this verse several times already, but appropriate once again. Call to me and I will show you, answer you and tell you great and mighty things you do not know. Jeremiah 33, 3. Hallelujah to Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides for our every need, including the need to know the truth found in his word, which enables us to stand firm in this unseen battle that rages all around us. Thank you, Abba. All glory, praise, honor, and blessing to you. Continuing on now with the next cross-reference for Stand Firm in the Faith, Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. After reading all those references, what did Jesus do for us on the cross? He died and with his sacrificial blood paid the price required by God for the penalty of our sin. And that is so magnificent. But what else did he do for us? He not only paid a debt we could not pay, he also broke the chains releasing us from the bondage of sin. We have been liberated by the Spirit of the Lord who helped us recognize we needed a Savior. We heard the truth of God's Word. But Satan wants to deceive us into thinking we're still under his control because of our sinful nature. And if that doesn't work, he'll try to convince us that God's made us his slaves to do his bidding. And with all these tactics, the old serpent tries to strike again. But we raise the shield of faith and fight back with the sword of the Spirit, which says he's a liar. Because the moment we accept Jesus' sacrifice on our behalf, we are free from the spirit of slavery to sin that held us bound. And while in the bondage of that slavery, we were fearful because we had been given a sentence of death. But Jesus broke the chains, released us, and we no longer have to be fearful. We've been adopted by God and become his children. He's no longer our judge, but our father, Abba. And because his son set us free, the liberty we now possess is true freedom. There are some warnings noted here that we must not re neglect regarding our liberty. Does our freedom mean that we can now just do whatever we please? No. Galatians 5.13 says that we were called to freedom, but not to turn it into an opportunity for the flesh and sin. And it also states, through love serve one another. Hmm. Sounds similar to what Jesus said, doesn't it? Love thy neighbor as thyself. He said it was the second greatest commandment. Because by this they will know you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So that's the purpose for this liberty we now possess, not that we're free to do whatever we please. We have been saved by grace and are living under grace, but that doesn't give us approval to keep on sinning. What does the Bible say about sin once we have been set free from its bondage? It's not referenced in this section, but it needs to be discussed here. Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 says, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So with that said, let me ask you something. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't take us to heaven when we get saved? What is our purpose for having to remain here? We have been set free through faith in Jesus and received a wonderful inheritance through him. But there are still others that need to hear the good news of the gospel so they can be set free too. We were given this freedom to point the way to Jesus. While we're still here, we have influence for the kingdom of the Lord. Jesus gave us the great commission to bring others into the kingdom and make them disciples. And that's why we're still here. Another warning from this section says that, we, that when we continue to sin, we test God. 
The Israelites are given as our example, and because they continued to do evil, God handed them over to the Philistines, and they stayed in bondage for 40 years. Philippians 1.27a says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy, and it's reference Ephesians 4. 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were you have been called. As Christians, we carry the name of Christ, and we should live in a way that does not tarnish Christ's name or reputation. While uh, When others learn that we're a Christian, they watch us to see if we walk the walk or just talk the talk. And the way we live and act could very well influence their decision to come to Christ, or conversely, their decision to run away from Him. And the people that surround us aren't the only ones watching us. The enemy's associate, associates watch too, just looking for a place to get even a little toehold into our minds and lives. And lastly, there's that great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, including the author of this passage we study, who watch to see if we will stand firm and bring honor and glory to the name of Christ Jesus. That's the reason Paul tells us to conduct ourselves in a manner which warrants us wearing his name because others are watching. We want to bring Jesus Christ glory, not shame, and should always remember our witness is important because we are Christians. Philippians 1.27b says of the gospel of Christ, and it references Philippians 1.5. Excuse me, Philippians 1.15. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. What does a reference from Philippians 1 verse 15 have to do with standing firm on the gospel of Christ? To be honest, when I first began typing out the verse, I thought I'd made an error concerning the numerical reference, so I rechecked it again. But it was correct. But it didn't seem to fit. So I went back and examined it in the context of its passage. Scripture interpreting scripture. <laughs> and here's what verse 16 says. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives. Oh, is this telling me that there are people out there spread... Uh, preaching for their own selfish benefit and not to save the lost or disciple the saints? Hmm. Now it makes perfect sense why that reference is here in this section on standing firm in the faith. My dear brothers and sisters, this type of activity of certain preachers comes from the enemy's camp. Several ministries come instantly to my mind, but I will suffice it to say that I don't listen to these prosperity preachers that speak only about God's love and financial blessing and never about sin, repentance, or the fear or wrath of God. And I don't mention them by name because I refuse to allow the enemy to use it as a source of causing division, a skill in which he's very proficient, within this group from people who feel the need to argue a defense of these people. Well, we're not the judge. As pastors, they will incur a stricter judgment, so let it be between them and God. I just steer clear of them, for with the devil, you don't just go on the defenses, sometimes you have to go on the offensive. So I choose to steer clear of these preachers, teachers. One last thing about division. I posted the core beliefs for this group so I would know what I believe in the attempt to head off division by stating right up front what I do believe. And these belief statements are the foundational support of the comments being made during this study. Now, back to the verse above. Paul said some preached out of love, the same as it is today. The phrase, knowing that I am pointed for the defense of the gospel, means Paul was keeping up with the churches he had established to make sure they remained true to the appointed and anointed teachings of the gospel that he had imparted to them. But there's another who's keeping up with the churches to make sure they remain true to the gospel, and that's Jesus. He's keeping up with his churches too, and nothing is hidden from his piercing eyes of flame. Go read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. He will deal with the shepherds and teachers of his word, warning of a stricter judgment, which I personally take very seriously. We haven't been looking 
at the four set of references, but I want to do that now because 2 Corinthians 11.13 says, For such men are false prophets, deceitful workers, disguising them as apostles of Christ. Aha! Now this makes perfect sense as to why the verse was put there. More enemy activity. So why is it important to stand firm on the truth of the gospel? Because there are people out there twisting and distorting it for their own selfish ambitions. My dear brothers and sisters, this is one more proof that Jesus is coming back soon, as he said in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24. He said these people would lead many away. And I'll say it again because it's imperative to know the scriptures in order to discern false teachings and lies. I challenge you to always test the spirits of everything you hear by the word of God. For not knowing originally why the verse is here, I sure ended up having a lot to say about it. Well, it really wasn't me, but the Holy Spirit. So all glory to him. Philippians 1.27 says, So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, that that I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Why does the text say strive for the faith of the gospel? And then the reference of Jude 3, contend earnestly for the faith in these references. Because we're in a spiritual battle. The enemy causes God's people to be distracted from our mission to further Jesus' kingdom by causing division arguing back and forth over things that really won't matter in the long haul, instead of spending our energy, time, and resources to save the lost that are perishing. We all have been given the Holy Spirit if we belong to Christ and should be like-minded, united as one heart and soul, striving to lift up the name of Jesus, bringing others to Him, and contending earnestly for the faith. Time is of the essence, and we can't waste it. There are so many who are still blind, deaf, and deceived. Philippians 4, 1a, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown. Philippians 1, 8, For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 1b, So stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Reference, uh, references 1 Corinthians 16, 13 and Philippians 1, 27. Philippians is an actual letter written to an actual church, but it was written and recorded for us too. And while working on this study, when I came to these verses where Paul says, My beloved brethren whom I long to see, I took it personally and cried when I thought about how much Paul suffered for the truth of the gospel. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And when I think of all Paul wrote to instruct us and help us to grow in our relationship to the Lord, almost half of the New Testament, I realize it could only have been done out of a great love and devotion to Christ after his conversion, as well as love for those who would read and study his letters. And his willingness to suffer persecution for the sake of the gospel should humble us all. This man who suffered so much for the sake of the gospel now calls us beloved brethren while telling us to stand firm in the Lord. He loves us with the love of Christ as we should love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul obviously wants us to succeed in our fight and he longs to see us. He's watching and cheering us on toward the goal. I can't wait to meet him and tell him how this passage on the full armor strengthened and encouraged me to stand firm in the faith. But I won't be looking him up until after I've kissed the feet of my Lord Jesus. First th Thessalonians 3.8 For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6.13 Food is for the stomach and the stomach is for food, but God will do away with both of them. Yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now standing alone, this section is a bit confusing too, because we're talking here about standing firm in the faith. Okay, but what do we do when we run into this type of problem? We interpret scripture with scripture. You're going to get tired of me saying that, but I'm trying to impress this method of study upon you. So let's look at the first reference, 1 Thessalonians 3, 8. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. Huh? Really live? What does that mean? 
Saul went to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and read the verse in context of the chapter. Paul had received a good report from Timothy about how the church was standing firm in their faith in the gospel. I told you he was keeping an eye on them. So here Paul is rejoicing in that news, and because of that good report, he really lives. Paul was rejoicing because when you try and teach something, and people comprehend and understand it, it makes you very happy. Ask any teacher. So Paul is encouraged that they are following his teaching on the gospel of Christ and standing firm upon it as truth for their lives. And the next reference, 1 Corinthians 6.13, speaks of our body belonging to the Lord and not subjecting it to immoral acts. The point here is something that's already been mentioned in this session. Christ purchased our bodies with his own precious blood and our bodies now belong to him. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the passions and desires of the flesh. Fourth re level reference, Galatians 5.24. Our body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Fourth level reference, 1 Corinthians 6.19. Who dwells within us and we should not sin our, against our body but glorify God through it. Second Thessalonians 2.15a, so then brethren stand firm. Second Thessalonians 2.15b, and hold to the traditions which you were taught. Second Thessalonians 2.15c, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. In this section, Paul is telling the church to hold to the traditions it was taught. But what tradition is Paul speaking of? He is speaking of the tradition of working hard and not being idle. This admonition is related to what he wrote about earlier in the chapter regarding a false teaching that Jesus had already returned. People had probably decided to give up their livelihoods and stop working, and Paul warns them not to do that. Instead, they are to keep the traditions that they have been taught, namely to work hard, not to be weary in well-doing, and to avoid those who would refuse what he had written. And this same warning applies for us as well. Just because we see, through the lens of Bible prophecy, the approach of Jesus' return doesn't mean we throw up our hands, sit down, and just wait. Oh no. Get back out there on the highways and byways of daily life. Remember those still walking in darkness? They need to see the great light shining in the darkness, and we've got the light within us. We need to, 1 Corinthians 16, 13, act like men. References 1 Samuel 4, 9, 2 Samuel 10, 12. What attribute of God's character can be found within these references? One is found in 2 Samuel chapter 10, verse 12, where it says, May the Lord do what is good in his sight. And it's found again in 1 Samuel 3, 18. It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. God can do whatever seems good to him because God is sovereign. And if you were to look up the word sovereign in the dictionary, you would find words and phrases like superior, greatest, supreme in power and authority, ruler, independent of all others in its definition. But the way I like to explain God's sovereignty best is simply to say God is in control. God can do all things and accomplish all things. Nothing is too difficult for him. He orchestrates and determines everything that is going to happen in your life, my life, and throughout the world. Whatever he wants to do in the universe, he does, for nothing is impossible with him. And there's absolutely nothing that happens in the universe that is outside of God's influence and authority. As King of kings and Lord of lords, God has no limitations. God is in control of all things and rules over all things. He has a power and authority over nature, earthly kings, history, angels, and demons. Even Satan himself has to bow to God's sovereignty and ask God's permission before he can act. That's what being sovereign means. It means being the ultimate source of all power, authority, and everything that exists. And only God can make those claims. Therefore, it's God's sovereignty that makes him superior to all other gods and makes him and him alone worthy of worship. And this sovereign God has made a promise to us in this section. What is the promise? God tells us to be strong and courageous because he goes with us and will never fail or forsake us. He's not like world rulers today who send people into war while sitting on the sidelines. He's right there in the battle with us. 
and I don't know about you, but that makes me strong and courageous. It provides incomparable strength which will sustain us through the battle. One more point to make concerning this section it is concerning reference Joshua 1 6. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. God tells Joshua to be strong and courageous, for he had promised to give Israel possession of the land, and they were about to enter it. Why would that require being strong and courageous? There were giants that inhabited the land. So why do we care about that? How does that even apply here? Well, who is it that we're fighting against? It's not a giant, but it's someone who's just as intimidating as one, not to mention formidable as one. That's why we need the full armor of God to be able to stand firm against him. One last application. The Israelites were about to go into the promised land. We're about to go into the promised land too, aren't we? The promised land of heaven. That should encourage us too because it means the battle is coming to an end for God's children. So hang in there. Be strong in the Lord. Soon and very soon we're going to see the King. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God that was slain for our sin. 1 Corinthians 16, 13d. Be strong. References Psalm 31, 24, Ephesians 3, 16, Ephesians 6, 10, and Colossians 1, 11. Psalm 31, 24, be strong and let your heart take courage, all of you who hope in the Lord. Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. What does the phrase, let your heart take courage, mean? Maybe you're facing a critical decision and don't know which way to go. Or perhaps you've been praying about a certain matter, but God is not responding. At such times, the only thing we want is instant relief or immediate direction. Yet God says to your heart, take courage as you wait on him. What does to wait on the Lord mean? To wait for the Lord means remaining in your present circumstances until God gives further instruction. Not to be just passive, but to make an active choice to be at rest, trusting in him and his timing. It's not a cessation of daily activities, but an internal stillness of spirit. And there are various reasons God may have us wait on him, and I'll not go into those now. But we'll suffice it to say we need to just keep our focus on Jesus no matter what the circumstance. It's easy to become so absorbed in our own concerns that we forget about him. Because nothing grabs our attention like a difficult situation. And when God doesn't rush to give an answer or fix the problem, only then do we make him our main focus. However, there is a difference between seeking the Lord and seeking his intervention. If our thoughts are only on what we want him to do for us, we've missed the mark. For to wait for the Lord means our focus is to be on him. Trusting him with the outcome, not simply, simply focusing on our desired outcome. Why do we fret so needlessly? His word tells us to be anxious for nothing but to carry everything to him in prayer. But that's where most people stop with that verse. But the rest of the verse says, With thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6. When we go to God in prayer, the first thing on our list should be praise, followed by thanksgiving. Both of these place our focus on him. Then comes intercession for others followed by confession of our sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive us. And, and if we say we have no sin, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Last on the list comes petitions or requests. For you see, it's not about what we want. It's all about what he wants. Remember, he is sovereign and does as he pleases and as he sees fit. But we can have peace while we wait on the Lord's answer if we trust his word, which tells us in Romans 8:28 that if we love him and have been called according to his purpose, we can be at rest, assured that everything will work out for our good. Ephesians 3:16a that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the attaining of all steadfastness and patience joyously. 
from the references above, what should we pray for that will help us to be strong? We need to ask to be strengthened with power through His Spirit according to the power of Jesus. It's His power that gives us the ability to be steadfast and patient. And the possession of this ability provided through His power should bring us joy and cause us to walk in humility and gentleness, showing self-control in love toward others. Because when we have the power of Christ and the Holy Spirit within us, we can do all things through that power. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 a, you therefore, my son, references 2 Timothy 1, 2, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. In this section, these cross-references, Paul recognizes both Timothy and Titus as a true child of the faith. And you know what? Our commander Jesus also wants people to recognize us as his true children of the faith standing firm on his gospel, and fighting to increase his kingdom. And because that's what Jesus wants, it's what I want too. 2 Timothy 2, 1b, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What points are made within the cross-references listed? Paul was called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, 1 Corinthians 1, 1 and 2 Corinthians 1, 1. Did you notice how thorough and consistent the Holy Spirit is in those references? Both of those books start saying the same thing. Paul was appointed by the will of God to teach this passage we're studying. And I think it's awesome he wanted us to know that. It proves God's word is solid as a rock and we can stand firmly upon it. We can be strong in the grace that is found in the Lord. Our liberator makes us strong. We have been made sons and daughters through faith in Christ Jesus, according to the promise of life in his Son. We've been given a good foundation to stand upon, which provides us a glorious future. And when we take hold of all that in the eternal life we now have, it will strengthen us to be able to be strong, stand firm, and fight the good fight. Ephesians 6.10b, and in the strength of his might, Reference Ephesians one nineteen, Ephesians one nineteen a says, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working. Ephesians chapter three verse seven, Colossians one twenty nine, and Ephesians six ten. And I want to read some of these cross references to you. Ephesians three seven, of which I was made. 3, Ephesians 3, 7b, a minister according to the gift of Ephesians 3, 7c, God's grace which was given me. Ephesians 3, 7d, working according to the working of his power, Colossians 1, a and for this purpose also I labor, Colossians 1, b, striving, Colossians 1, c, according to his power which mightily works within me. Ephesians 1, 19b, of the strength of his might, Ephesians 6, 10. The first part of verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord. And now we ca we've come to the last part of the verse, in the strength of his might. Let's examine the first cross reference, but in its, but in its entirety. Ephesians 1, 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. So what is this surpassing greatness of the power to us who believe? It's the power that God wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The resurrection power that raised up the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead is the power that works in every single believer. And the measure of the power that is to us who believe is that same mighty power which entered into Jesus Christ and resurrected him from the dead. That power works in every one of us. Paul says here in this reference it was working mightily within him. God's power goes far beyond all other power. God has the power to go above all that we can think or ask according to the power that works within us. This is a continually surpassing power because there will never be a day when it's not sufficient to accomplish what God has purposed. So in the strength of his might means we have been given strength to fight the battle from God's power, a divine, dynamic, eternal energy. 
We've got so much to be thankful for. God has provided for every need. We just need to study his word and stand firm upon his truth. Take everything to him in prayer and then wait for him on everything. And Paul wants us to know us that this great surpassing power that is within us will help us to stand firm. The power of Christ applied in the believer's behalf can't be defeated because the creator's, creator's power exceeds that of Satan and his minions. We could never defeat these spiritual foes in our own power, but we can through the strength of God's power. We must know not only what we believe, but why we believe it, so we are able to share the good news of the gospel with others. We learn how to do this by studying and meditating on the word of God. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. It's the reason we're still here. It's the reason we fight, to increase his kingdom, not in our own strength but in his. Each victory must be won, won through the strength of his might. We must learn this lesson first in order to be successful in the battle. Please watch this video and then never, ever forget the great power behind you. March on, Christian soldiers.